Today we're talking about week two in our Verses series. And what we're doing in the series is we're taking, uh, we're taking two concepts in the Christian life that seem like they go against each other. They seem like they're, they're maybe in contradiction to each other, but they're really not, okay? And so we've been tackling, uh, last week we tack, tackled some stuff that was, it was great. Last week, if you missed it, all that stuff is online. Today's topic, uh, if you haven't picked up one of these, I really encourage you, if you've got the Alpine app, to pull up the lesson today because you might kind of want to follow along because we're going to use some big words today. We don't normally use big words. It was not my idea, but we're going to use some big words today because today we're talking about freedom versus moral duty. Freedom to do what we want versus the moral duty to do what we should. So that's what we're talking about. And there's a real dichotomy here for a lot of people in the, for the Christian life. In fact, if some of you are here today and you would not yet call yourself a Christian, maybe this is, this is a topic that you really are interested in talking about because from my perspective, one of the things that keeps Americans from becoming Christians in fact, one of, the things, one of the reasons why Christianity is on the decline in America is because, I think, is because in America we love our freedoms. I'm free. I'm free to do whatever I want, right? I'm, it's the land of the free. So I want freedom to, uh, to make my own entertainment choices. I want freedom to make my own decisions about money. What I just, the joke I just told, you're like, yeah, I am so glad that I am not a giver. Because I can buy whatever car I want, I can buy whatever house I want, and you can't tell me what to do. And my grandparents, or my parents used to give to the church, and they tied to the church, and man, that is such an outdated thing. I know a lot of, of my friends in the neighborhood, when I'm trying to engage them, I want them, uh, more than anything else, I want them to meet Jesus. More than anything else, I want them to meet Jesus. But what I'm up against is that they feel like becoming a Christian means that they're giving up their freedom. i got to be at church on Sunday morning? There's games going on. The brackets are coming out tonight, right? Like, come on. I want to I wanna just, I want to be able to kind of live my life however I want. It got really quiet in here. Is this not, maybe there are some people in here who feel this way too. Like, you're, you're like, this, yes, actually, now that you bring it up, I do feel a little bit, like I've lost some of my freedoms to come to Christ. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to use this, this podium here as kind of the center point, right? So over here on the left side, this is like a, this is like a match, right? Like a bo- boxing. On the left side, at 220 pounds, we, weighing in from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we have moral duty. Moral duty is I've got to keep the rules, I've got to keep the laws. There are certain laws or certain rules that are right, that I should follow, that I have to follow. So this is the shoulda side. Everyone say shoulda. Everyone say shoulda, woulda. Everyone say shoulda, woulda, coulda. That's this side over here. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? I got this list of rules, and you think of this as religion and religiosity, so you have this on the, on the left side or on your right side. That's on this side. Okay? Moral duty. I have to do this. I must do this. I'm required to do this. My mom said so. My pastor said so. God said so. Whatever authority figure said so. That's on this side. On this side, we have the freedom side. This is the American side, right? This is the, I want to do whatever I want to do. This is the want to side. If that's the have to side, this is the want to side. This is what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. I want to do whatever I want to do. This is why so many people don't follow God. They they because they think it's just a bunch of rules and regulations and lists, and I gotta do this stuff, and I'm kind of under someone's thumb, but I want to live over here. I want to be free like an American, and I want to just do whatever I want to do. This is the want side. And the tension is Christians are called to understand both. If you're a Christian, I want you to really pay attention to this. I want you to think about what would you put on this side? What are the things that you want to do? 
and make a list just real quick in your own mind. Okay, what's, what's on this side, the stuff you want to do? Some of it might be good stuff. Some of it might be bad stuff. You don't have to publish this list anywhere. Please don't tweet it out. Okay? This is the want to side. Be honest. What's on your want to side? And over here, this is on the have to side. What are the things that you feel like, you feel an obligation to do, you have to do? This is the moral duty side. And I've just got a few things to share about those two things. The first thing is just the scripture verse that frames all of this. Galatians 5, verse 1, it says this. So Christ has truly set us free. What a great half verse. (laughs) Christ has truly set us free. And all the ears of all the Americans perks up right here. And we say, oh, really? I'm free? I do whatever I want to do? But look what he says next. He says, now make sure you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Don't get tied up in slavery to the law. Oh, this is good. I want to read the rest of this chapter. I want to read the rest of Galatians. Galatians is a six-chapter book. I encourage you to read it this week if today's message does anything for you. I want you to read Galatians because in Galatians, Paul unpacks everything we're talking about today. And he talks about this tension between these two things. Two major points. Number one, you can't truly be moral without freedom in Christ. You can't truly, I know that's really kind of a complicated way to say it. You can't truly be moral. You can't have this without this. That's a biblical concept. See, here's what religion does. Here's what institutions do. Religion and institutions, they say, hey, listen, here, if you're going to be a follower of God, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, then let me just give you our set of rules, our list of rules. You've got to do all of these things, and you've got to be a moral person. You've got to be a dutiful person. And you should do this, and you should do that, and you should do this, and let me give you this checklist. Some of you maybe know what I'm talking about. Some of you maybe grew up in a church like this. Some of you might even just be hardwired like this. You know, some of us, if you're just depending on your personality, some of you just might have this more hardwired. You're just a dutiful person. You're a good son or a good daughter. Like you just want to be obedient. Some of you, raise your hand if you have this in you. You just, like there's, you're, you're hardwired to just, you want to be, you want to please your parents. Raise your, we have nobody in here that is like this. There should be some people, that, thank you. You're all mutants, you know, the ones who didn't raise their hands. No, but yeah, some of us are wired a little bit more to be dutiful, right? Just nature. Tom, Tom, Pastor Tom says this to me all the time. He says, Brian, you would be a good person even if you weren't a Christian. I don't know if I agree with him, but he thinks I'm wired like this, don't you, Tom? How many of you are wired like Tom over here on this side? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're wired the other way. His wife is raising her hand too. Raise your hand if you're wired. Yeah, we've got a child. This is a self-aware six-year-old that understands us. That's awesome. That you're just like, I... Like, I am wired to just do whatever the heck I want to do. I have no desire to please anybody else but me. That's this side. Now, maybe you wouldn't say it so harshly, but you're just like, yeah, I just, I don't really have a sense in me that I feel like I I owe anything to anybody. I just want to do whatever I want. Some of us are wired more one way or the other, and some of us grew up in churches that were, that were, that put these laws and these rules and these restrictions and some of you have run away from churches like that because they said I got to do this and this and this and this and I've got to keep all these rules in order to be right with God but here's the point you can't be moral you can't really keep the rules without freedom in Christ there's no way to do this to really do what God requires without having been set free from Jesus for, because of what Jesus did in the first place. You know, let, me, let me just say another way. If you try to keep a list, this is Old Test, This is what the, every follower of God in the Old Testament was trying to do, is they were trying to keep the Ten Commandments. They're trying to keep the Ten Commandments, but nobody can keep all the Ten Commandments. 
Most of us can keep the easy ones, like don't kill anybody. Raise your hand if you kill something. No, just kidding. Don't do this. <laughs> Talk to me afterward. We, kept, we keep some of them, but then some of them are like, don't lie. I mean, come on, God. Why do you got to put that one in there? How about just don't lie totally on purpose? How about that? Because maybe then I can start, ra- no, I can't even raise my hand to that one. Don't covet something that someone else has, your neighbor. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Come on, God, why do you got to put that one in there? Why don't you just say, don't covet really hard? I won't covet really hard, but can't I just covet a little bit? This is what Jesus is talking about in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. And then he says this, but I tell you, don't even look upon a woman with lust in your heart. Because if you've done that, you've already committed adultery in your heart. See, keeping the rules from a religious standpoint is all about actions. But what God is interested is in attitude. Because from your attitude flows your actions. And so that's what this point means is when we come to faith in Christ, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new attitude. And from that new attitude, we can start doing these things over here that someone who's just a really religious, self-disciplined person might be already doing, but it's not acceptable to God because he's doing it on his own power and his attitude still stinks. You know what his attitude is now? I'm going to do this myself. I'm a good person. I am good enough to do this myself. I can work my way to God. That's the attitude of religiosity. You know, that stinks just as much as the attitude over here that says, I don't need God. It's all the same thing. And so the point is, you can't truly be moral. Like, you can't really, like, uphold the the moral code of God. Like, His expectation for your life. There's no way that you can uphold this apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, then everything that you do over here is pleasing to him. When you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, everything you do over here is just you trying to be really religious. And religious doesn't save anyone. It's not that it's bad. God's law is good. God never said that his law is bad. It's good. His law is good. But when you come over here and you try to do this stuff from your own moral dutifulness, then you'll fail. And some of you maybe are listening right now saying, you know what, I have done that. I have failed at that. I think I know what you're talking about. I'm mentoring a guy right now who came out of a very religious background. And as we've been talking over the weeks, I and mean, we've been talking for probably six months every week, and as we talk and we're unpacking stuff, it's become clear to me that if you think about our circle, what it means to be a Christian, that, that three that, three, that circle of three things and foundations, we start by trusting Jesus. That's the first thing. And then number two is we live a God-honoring life over here. And you know what he's wrestling with is he's trying to do this, the second thing, before he got the first thing. You can't do the second thing before you do the first thing. If you try to honor God before you've trusted Jesus for salvation, which leads to true freedom in your life, if you try to honor God just on your own work and on your own effort, it won't work. And this is what he was trying to do. I said, you're trying to do step two before you do step one. You gotta trust Jesus first for salvation. There might be some of you in here today who say, I kind of am there right now. Maybe you didn't think about it that way, but I'm trying to earn my way through moral duty. I'm trying to earn my way I'm trying to do all the shouldas to earn my way to Jesus. When the Bible says that you need freedom in Christ, that's the first thing. And you only get freedom in Christ by trusting Jesus for salvation. We have a baptism today after the service. It's awesome. This woman has trusted in Jesus for her salvation. She's got a a past. Many of us have a lot of stuff in our past that, that we recognize is wrong. She recognized it was wrong. And she's turning to Jesus for salvation. She did. She turned to Jesus for salvation. And guess what? She's free in Christ now. And over the next, you know, months and years, she's going to be able to move more and more and be able to do what God wanted her to do all along. That's kind of the second point right here. 
Second point, to, to, the, to sort of play on the other side of this, is you can't be truly free without moral duty. So that first point really talks to the person who tries to be really religious on their own effort. The second point talks to somebody who doesn't care about what God wants, and they totally misunderstand Christianity. And I know there are probably way more people in here that the second point will land for than the first point, because we're not a very religious church. I don't know if you've picked up on that yet. I'm wearing jeans, right? And I'm up here on stage, I'm wearing jeans. And I see people coming in shorts and drinking coffee and all kinds of things that are, that's just, you know, some people will be like, man, you guys are really free. Like, wow, you guys are really free. Yeah, we are free. We are totally free in Christ. But you can't be truly free without that side. Did you know that? Did you know that you really aren't being free if there's all this stuff that God has already said to you He's already articulated this in his word. He explains what he wants from us. And we just, so American Christians, because of our freedom mentality, we can just get in this thing where we just say, God, thank you for saving me, but I don't want to live life your way. Don't make me live life your way. Don't make me give up my addictions. Don't make me give up the way I spend my money. I can watch whatever movie I want to watch. I'm free. We don't put, I don't know if you notice, we don't, we don't tell you you can't watch R-rated movies. We don't tell you who to vote for come election day. We don't tell you how much money you have to give. We encourage you to give. We don't even tell you you have to work in kids' church. We just remind you that you'll go to heaven if you do. <laughs> that was a joke. So we're not, we're, I think the danger of being in a church like Alpine and growing up in a church like Alpine is you could get the wrong idea. You could get the wrong idea that you can truly be free and have no sense of obligation, no sense of moral duty at all, that God wants me to do certain things. He does. So you're probably like, well, what, what kinds of things? Well, start with the Ten Commandments. Those are still legitimate. But even go beyond the Ten Commandments. You know, when the Pharisees, these really religious people, said to Jesus, what's the most important law? And they were expecting him to give one of the Ten Commandments. He, Matthew 22, he said, love the Lord your God with everything you have, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's all he said. So see, what he was doing is, even to, a, to these people who were so good at keeping lists, they're like scrambling, look, looking for that on their list. It wasn't even on their list. Do you know Why? Because it's an attitude thing that leads to actions. But their religion was all about all these actions instead of the heart attitude that comes from a real relationship with God. But don't misunderstand it. It's not that that God, when you become a Christian, that God says, just go do whatever you want now. You watch any movie you want now. You're free. You can, young people, you can listen to any music you want now. You're free. You can wear whatever you want. You're free. You can access anything you want on your phone because you're free. Because you're saved by grace. So you do whatever you want. Can you see how wrong that is? That's not a biblical message. The biblical message is You're free in Christ, and now that freedom in Christ changes what you want. So is it true that you can do whatever you want? Yes, you can do whatever you want if what you want is what God wants. That's the message. The message is God gives us boundaries within which to live, and these boundaries aren't bad. They're not wrong. This is what God wanted for us all along. One of the best ways to understand this is is uh, in terms of fish being made for water. In fact, if you guys have kids in Kids Church, you know that we kidify all of our sermons, so there's a kids video for today's message. And as I was prepping the sermon, I realized there's no better way for me to explain this concept than to show you the kids video. This is what the kids are learning, and I think it'll help us to learn. Take a look.
all over the Bible. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And yet Christianity today, especially in America, has just turned into just do whatever you want. That's what we think grace is. Just do whatever you want. No! Fish, I love the line, fish aren't free to go for a walk in the park. They're not free to do that. They were made for water. You were made, you and I were made to live a certain way. And when we have freedom in Christ, we can live that way. Does that make sense? Look at what Jesus says it like this. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. Jesus didn't, maybe at the beginning of this message, you were thinking that I was going to be like over here the whole time. Like, this is where we should be, man. This is where we should live, you know? And then I'd be like, this is bad. Be, just because of, of the, some, of the, some of the baggage that we have related to it, you know, religiosity and legalism and all that stuff, this is not bad. Legalism's bad. Religiosity is bad. But God's rules are not bad. His laws are not bad. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that God said, oop, I'm so sorry. When I gave you those Ten Commandments, I don't know what I was thinking. I am so sorry. I was wrong. I changed my mind. I didn't mean that. He doesn't do that. In fact, Jesus comes and he says, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses, these Ten Commandments. I didn't come to get rid of them. I came to accomplish their purpose. And then he goes on and he says, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear. Heaven and earth haven't disappeared. So he's talking about now. Now. Not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear. God's law is good. His commandments are good. His rules are good. His boundaries are good. They are not bad. They are good. They're like a part of the instruction manual he designed for us to live by all along. Don't kill. It's bad for your relationships. That's supposed to be funny. Don't steal. It's bad for your relationships. Don't covet. It's bad for your relationships. Don't lie. It's bad for your relationships. Are you catching on to this? And so when the Pharisee said, what's the most important rule? He says, don't think about the rules. It's about relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with people. All of the rules can be seen in terms of relationship. But if you've ever had a relationship with a terrible rule-breaking person, you'll understand the beauty of rules. You don't want a relationship with someone who just st- does whatever they want to. They take advantage of you. They just, they totally lie. They just, they lie, they cheat, they steal. It's all about them. It's all about them. You see people like that, and you're like, this is not good. And these people over time realize that they don't have any friends anymore because they're toxic and they're no good. Why? Because they're breaking the rules. God's rules are meant to give us life. God's rules are like, for us, are like water for fish. It's good. When we try to jump out of them, it's not good. When we try to extricate ourselves from the environment and the boundaries that God has intended for us to live in, it's not good. But here's the point. We cannot live these rules out on our own. The Bible says that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that we become new people and we become free people. Not free to do whatever our old person wants, but free to do what God wanted all along. That's what, that's what this last verse is all about. It says in Ezekiel 36, this is a promise that God made. He said, I will give you a new heart. He's talking about this Christian over here on this side. I'll give you a new heart. Think of that as an attitude. I'll give you a new attitude. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Wouldn't that be nice if that happened to every person you're in relationship with? Parents, wouldn't that be nice if God would do that for your kids? That they would give them a new heart? If they're followers of Jesus, he has given them a new heart. And so now with that new heart, from the inside out, they can begin to live according to what God wanted for them all along. And so 
these two things, they kind of meet right here in the middle. But religion without freedom in Christ is just someone trying to take rules from the outside and force them into you to become a better person. But the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, he puts his rules inside us through his spirit. And the spirit is a perfect embodiment of everything, of all the, of everything that the rules were about in the first place. And so as we live according to the spirit, and this is what Paul says later in Galatians 5, as we live according to the spirit, we begin to act differently. And the fruit of the spirit begins to be evident in our lives and pretty soon we look like this person over here that someone else might mistake for a really religious person but we're not we're just changed from the inside because of what god did through jesus christ if you're a christian i hope you would hear that and i hope you'd be convicted to say god i want you to i want you to work that through me more in my life and if you're here today and you'd say i'm not a christian yet the best thing you can do is put your faith in Jesus Christ because that makes you truly free to begin to live that stuff out.